Hello, everyone, and welcome to our April 2021 Foresight Friday. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jessica Streit, and I'm the Deputy Director of NIOSH's Office of Research Integration. Uh, at this time, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Sarah Felkner, NIOSH's Associate Director for Research Integration, for some brief opening remarks. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Um, I am Sarah Feltner and the Associate Director for Research Integration at NIOSH and welcome to Foresight Friday. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's Foresight Friday speaker, Dr. Rafael Ramirez. Dr. Ramirez is the first professor of practice at the University of Oxford, where he directs the Oxford Scenarios Program and the Oxford Network Strategy Lab. He's one of the world's leading experts on scenario planning and has worked extensively with non-governmental organizations, corporations, intergovernmental agencies, governments, and think tanks. He's the author of several books and scholarly papers, and he sits on the editorial boards of three scenario planning journals. Dr. Ramirez holds a PhD from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and master's degrees from York University in Toronto and Oxford. Prior to coming to Oxford, Dr. Ramirez was part of Shell's scenario team and professor of management in HEC in Paris. Uh, Dr. Ramirez is co-developer of the Oxford scenario planning approach, which focuses on how scenario planning can be used to support strategy and public policy. And it is now our privilege to welcome Dr. Ramirez to NIOSH. Rafael? Thank you very much, Sarah. Can you see me okay? Yes, I can and hear you okay. Okay, and I'm gonna share my screen and if this works, that'll be great. Can you see this okay? We see your slides, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to NIOSH and uh, for, for this event. I'm, I'm quite privileged on it. I got into scenario planning literally by accident. Um, in May of 1976, I was working as a carpenter for the Canadian Coast Guard in Hay River in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Uh, that's the southernmost place where the Canadian Coast Guard has a station to service the Mackenzie River, which is used as a highway in the winter. And in the summer, it's full of barges that uh, take material up to uh, the Arctic for uh, oil and gas exploration. And uh, I had an accident, um, became 20 in the hospital in Hay River. And um, that in effect changed my life. I, I was not a great carpenter, obviously, having had an accident and um, ended up um, in hospitals in Alberta and Ontario. Uh, they did pay for my last year of university and, and the rest is history, as they say. And I entered what uh, for me was a surprising world of the industrial accident and the, and the victims of industrial accidents. I created from that Canada's first program uh, of literacy for injured workers. In those days, the hypothesis was that uh, injured workers that were illiterate were dangerous because they could not read safety and um, uh, uh, rules and then they got themselves into accidents. And I came up with an alternative hypothesis, which is that uh, there are dangerous jobs and less dangerous jobs. And if you are well educated as uh, Dr. Feltner and I, and I guess everybody on this call is, uh, we get the less dangerous jobs. But if you're uh, an illiterate, you get the dangerous jobs. And it was the job not the uh, not the illiterate person that was dangerous. And I helped these illiterate people, some of whom were very, very smart and capable to become literate so that they could then enter the uh, retraining uh, schemes that were available to them across Canada, but which were, were not available to them if they were still illiterate. And with Frontier College in Toronto, I ran this for two years. This world of the accident is a very strange world. Uh, somehow in our societies, in, in uh, quote unquote advanced Western countries, we accept that there's uh, these huge numbers of people that are killed and maimed at the job 
uh, 54 times more people wounded in the American workplace than in the Vietnam War, 14,000 workplace homicides. So going to work is, is dangerous. 14,000 is, is more than three times 9-11 and still this is considered to be quote unquote normal. It was not always the case that this rate of injury and uh, disease, and in the case of the US homicides at work, was so acceptable. This guy, Francois Ewald, um, who was, uh, is a remarkable scholar, he uh, was doing his doctorate in France roughly at the same time as I was finishing my doctorate from Wharton looked at the history of the welfare state. And he basically has this hypothesis that the industrial accident in France is at the basis of the, of the welfare state. Uh, the number of people being killed by industrialism in France was enormous, maybe even higher than the figures I've just shown uh, for the United States. And there were lots and lots of widows and lots and lots of um, uh, maimed people. And there was a, a big societal push against industrialization. And in order to um, minimize the bad effects that um, on, on accidents and health that um, industrialization was having, according to Francois Evald, um, the owners pooled some money and the workers pooled some money for the widows and so on. And when um, the government saw that there were two pools of risk management being uh, operated side by side, joining them together gave rise to the welfare state, at least in France. I don't know if that is also the history of social security in the States, but I remember reading this book and saying, this is quite fascinating that uh, the industrial accident is the public good that then all kinds of other uh, social services uh, emanate from. So I got, as I say, into scenario planning literally by accident. The, um, the work I was doing on industrial health and safety led me to a remarkable scholar called Eric Trist, Scottish uh, man, who a uh, gentleman actually, who was then at York University in Toronto and who had written extensively about uh, how to design safer workplaces in coal mines in Northern uh, England and Scotland. And uh, I went to see him saying, you know, I'm working on how to design safer jobs. And I see that you have done this. And so he took me in and I did my master's degree with him. Um, and uh, by then he had moved from um, doing industrial accidents and, and safer designs to uh, doing search conferences, uh, which led me to uh, scenario planning. And so from workplaces to scenario planning was the, the bridge was Eric Trist, who was one of the founders of the Tavistock Institute here in the UK. And the Tavistock Institute created a form of scholarship, which I have adhered to as well as possible uh, in the new circumstances we're in, as opposed to what uh, was happening in uh, post-war Britain which is a, a set of books he published at the University of Pennsylvania Press called The Social Engagement of Social Science, a fantastic collection of essays. And the social engagement of social science suggests that we social scientists, I'm actually a card carrying social scientist in the uh, uh, British Association of Social Scientists, uh, we are here uh, partly to serve society and to help society uh, engage with the problematic issues it faces. And it happens to be that I do that through scenario planning. And we work very much like clinical doctors work in, uh, in the med School of Medicine. We, uh, we do actual engagements in the real world. So I'm hired as a consultant here and there to do work. And some of the consultancy engagements I do, uh, I become very good colleagues with my clients who then uh, become co-authors and we write books or papers or things together. So we do three things at the same time. We engage with societal problems. We uh, teach 
and I'll come back to that, and we do research uh, together. And when the three circles of engagement, research, and pedagogy come together and you have this magic uh, three for one uh, effect, uh, that's where being a professor of practice uh, has its sweet spot. The uh, book uh, that we use in the uh, scenarios program that I teach is this book on the left, which I co-authored with my dear colleague, Angela Wilkinson, who uh, was also at Shell uh, with me, came to Oxford and is now uh, Secretary General and CEO of the World Energy Council, a strategic reframing the Oxford scenario planning approach. And it's very important uh, before I move on to the MIT Sloan Management Review um, paper here on the right, to realize that for us, the scenario planning is not just to do foresight, it's to serve strategy. And in the business school uh, that employs me, I'm, I'm employed as a strategy uh, professor that, who happens to do scenario planning. I'm, I'm not a futurist, I'm not a foresight person, I'm a, I'm a strategy uh, person. And uh, over the years, we've had many opportunities, I'll come to touch on them in, in a moment, uh, to write up what we do. Uh, here is a piece of work that um, I co-authored with uh, three ex-students. Steve Churchhouse who was head of strategy at Rolls-Royce, the people that make airplane engines, not the posh cars. Uh, uh, when I met him, he then became head of digital for Rolls-Royce. Alejandra Palermo was head of foresight for the Royal Society of Chemistry. And Jonas, who's Brazilian, uh, had been with us in, in my class. And the, the, the four of us got together and compared in this MIT Sloan Management Review paper, how the methodology here on the left can be adapted to everything from uh, investing in the future of um, airplane engines to uh, investigating the future of a whole scientific field, uh, as is the case with, with chemistry. And uh, um, Steve did scenario planning at Rolls-Royce with our methodology. I was involved uh, as part of a relationship between Rolls-Royce and Oxford. Alejandra went and did her work on her own, but following our methodology, and then we, we wrote it back together. And it's nice to see that uh, this approach can be adapted to many different things. But we start with the user. And as opposed to doing uh, scientifically valid uh, explorations of truth, as is the case with um, chemists, we don't, we're not after truth in the future because truth is factual and all of the facts are in the past. I can take it for a fact that uh, we will end this um, um, call in uh, 45 minutes, but it isn't a fact. So we are not in scenario planning looking to be truthful about the future the way forecasters uh, pretend to be. We are looking to bring in useful perspectives with eyeglasses positioned in the future and bring those future possibilities that we construct as a point of view into the present to inform strategy here and now. So we look at the way we look and uh, these eyeglasses at the bottom here uh, illustrate that uh, those of us that have eyeglasses, uh, I'm one of them, we, we cannot take our, what our glasses tell us for granted. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to look beyond the frame of the glasses. Uh, the glasses will uh, transform what is seen in particular ways. And what we're going to do with scenario planning is to manufacture our set of eyeglasses to look at the present from a different point of view. And for a whole bunch of reasons, we locate those uh, points of view in the conceptual future uh, to serve that particular use and uh, user. Here's an example of the range of organizations beyond the Rolls-Royce and um, uh, Royal Society of Chemistry that, uh, that uh, the methodology has been applied to. On the Southwest, it's the future of AIDS in Africa done for the United Nations. A whole host of World Economic Forum activities have been informed by it. Uh, with Mercy Corps in the States, we looked at the future of humanitarian aid. 
I've worked twice with the uh, senior people at the International Monetary Fund. I'll come back to one piece of work on that. AXA has used this for cybersecurity. Airbus has used it. The British Medical Journal used scenario planning to look at the future of global um, uh, uh, global research. Vartsila, which makes engines for ships, used it on the future of shipping and power. Atkins, an engineering firm, looked at it for the future of the engineer. The National Breast Cancer Coalition looked at the future of its mission with it. The International Atomic Energy Agency has used it for the future of nuclear safeguards, probably one of the scariest pieces of, of work I've done. Diabetes UK on the future of diabetes, the European Patent Office on the future of patenting. Cisco did scenarios on the future of um, uh, the in, 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 internet and the gastroenterologist on the top right did work on the future of gastroenterology. So you can see that big and small organizations in the public domain, intergovernmental, governmental, uh, private NGOs can, can use this methodology and, and adapt it and make it render it useful. One of the key things that scenarios do is to frame the problem in different ways than the way it's framed today. So this is a, a, a bit of a cute picture uh, from Instagram of what you see in Instagram is not necessarily what is there to see. And one of the things we are very attentive to is what is the context of whatever it is that one is looking at. Uh, for example, if you're doing work on the future of uh, the um, price of energy, you can either frame out or you can frame in the cost of carbon. And depending on whether you frame it in or you frame it out, you get a totally different picture of what the future might hold for you. So one of the things we like to do, I was just on a call at the moment, uh, an hour ago with uh, a group of people using the methodology to assess uh, future demands for research on COVID, which includes some of your colleagues in the CDC, uh, what is going to be framed in and what is going to be framed out uh, in each of, of those scenarios. The, um, the methodology we use, uh, and that is quite distinct compared to, to other methodologies, including some I understand that you're using uh, in, in NIOSH, is um, this what my students call the onion, the three circles. Uh, the people that are served are in the yellow circle in the center. Uh, we do not think of them primarily as decision makers. Uh, some other uh, scenario planning methodologies uh, consider, but we think of them mainly as um, learners. And uh, I've been doing this now since uh, roughly 1980. Uh, I'm still learning how to do it and everybody is learning uh, about scenarios, but we think of the scenario user primarily as somebody that is learner, uh, a learner and who's learning about the context of the context that they inhabit. The first circle, the black circle, the transactional environment or business environment is made up of parties that from the point of view of the learner in the uh, center is a, um, is a person with whom they can shake hands uh, and with whom they do strategizing and with whom they have some influence because they have this relationship where they can shake hands with each other. So, if it's a company, you could have a, a client relationship strategy, which includes sales and, uh, and uh, customer satisfaction and, and customer retention strategies, which is the green arrow in the, in, 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 in between the yellow and the, and the black. You have an investor relations strategy for your shareholders and, and people that you borrow money from. You have a supply, supply chain strategy for your suppliers employee relations with your employees, competitor strategy, etc. So you strategize uh, with and for and in relation to these counterparts in the, in the black circle. Scenarios are uh, not the link between the yellow and the black, but between the light blue and the black. Scenarios are about the factors uh, in that blue circle that are beyond the influence of the actors, of the sorry, of the of the yellow um, um, 
central learner uh, user who is going to be using the scenarios. So uh, they might be able to influence their suppliers by negotiating with them or, or their clients or even their competitors by lowering prices or doubling prices or whatever. But they cannot influence the price of oil uh, or the um, demographics of Brazil or the geopolitical trends in the Middle East or uh, technological innovations coming out of uh, Japan or China. So these are the factors out there. And the important thing here is that uh, we're not doing scenarios of the organization itself, the yellow uh, part. We're doing scenarios of the context of the organization. And so we look at trends, which is here the blue arrow, which trends will continue uh, for a long time. So will the demographics uh, continue? Will climate accum CO2 accumulation in the environment uh, continue? Will increased uh, inequality continue over the period of time we're considering things? And then we look at things that could come from the future and uh, uh, new possibilities will uh, Russia change whenever Mr. Putin goes? Uh, will uh, Cuba change after the Castros? Will the uh, royal family uh, in this country, the UK, be any different? Once not only Prince Philip, who's just passed away, but also Queen Elizabeth uh, passes away, etc. And so we construct alternative uh, points of view in the future uh, where uh, whoever was a client in the black circle might be reclassified as a competitor in the purple circle or as a partner in the red circle uh, or as an investor in uh, the pink circle. And we start looking at what if the world is different uh, from the one that we are planning for, would those green arrows still hold or would we need to make them more uh, agile and different uh, should the red happen instead of the, the black? One thing that is really important in the English language, uh, which is not my native language, my native language is Spanish, is to be attentive to what we mean by different words. In, in our methodology, uh, scenarios are things that might happen to my context independently of my will, Options are things that I could potentially do on strategy is choices. Uh, in many contexts uh, of many of the people that come through our classroom, they think of options as scenarios, which is then highly confusing. So we, we need to be quite clear on the terms and what they mean. One of these very important ones is that the future is not the long term. And this is why when I was invited to join the board of the journal Futures, uh, I told them, you know, I'm not a futurist and a scenario planner. And they said, that's why we want you. We'll have enough futurists on the editorial board. Um, this is uh, uh, something that was highlighted to me by, by my colleague and co-author Angela Wilkinson. If you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, not uh, other dictionaries, uh, and you look up the meaning of the word the future, in English, the future is not something we go into. The future is something that comes at us. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, is a time to come. In Spanish, it would be por venir, a future to come. And it's a future that is to come and that is expected to be different from the present. So with scenario planning in the Oxford approach, we don't work for the future, we work with the future for the present. We work with the future that might come towards me and that informs the optionality that is open to me or close to me in making my strategies going forward. My strategy is my plan to go forward, but the future comes to me. So I'm not working for the future as a forecaster uh, uh, would, would do. I'm working with the future to the present. And in, I'm in a prospective condition when I'm attentive to the sense of future that I have in the present. Am I scared of it, excited by it, 
uh, hopeful, uh, or am I just ignoring that sense of future? Uh, ignoring the future is a choice uh, that many of us make because it's just too scary or time consuming to concern about ourselves with it. So let's be clear that the interface of the strategy is between myself as a learner with those I interact with. And the interface of the scenarios is between this big contextual environment that is beyond my influence, but might be coming towards me and the context in which I live in. So the scenarios inform not what I do, they inform the context in which I work and act. Uh, they always come in sets and uh, uh, it's very important that one of the usefulness of the scenarios is in the differences between them. The difference that makes a difference is where uh, information comes from. Uh, here on the left is an example of a piece of work done with the colleagues in the International Monetary Fund in Washington, where they looked at uh, things uh, on a two by two. Uh, a lot of the work we do is not on two by two, but this one was. Uh, and so uh, on the left side, uh, there's a world with quite a lot of trust and on the right one, uh, one with not a lot of trust. Uh, the north side is uh, a world in which I get substituted by a robot, um, technology substitutes humans. And the south one is I get to be even better as a faculty member with more coffee, more eyeglasses or better eyeglasses, perhaps hearing aids and all kinds of other things that I take to enhance my uh, competence. And we use this as a map, uh, not as four boxes. Uh, and um, uh, they put three scenarios they looked at, uh, technological race, Twin Peaks, and Circle of Trust. The uh, scenarios on the right were done uh, by an ex-student of ours in the World Economic Forum uh, in the middle of the 2008-2009 uh, economic um, meltdown. Uh, these were presented uh, in Davos in January of 2009. And the question was whether the pace of um, 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 economic power shift would be meaning basically New York and London do not do very well uh, and uh, Shanghai and uh, Singapore and Dubai do better, slower or rapid east or west, and whether the response would be harmonized or discordant. And um, this was just before the G20 uh, and all of the um, central banks got together and went harmonized to the north and uh, slowed things uh, going east uh, as fast as people feared. So we ended up much more in a re-engineered Western centrism, at least for quite some time, and most of financial services, uh, although some activities moved to other of the quadrants. So to make it uh, short, in the scenarios approach we have developed, we are not that interested in data or facts, in, except in as much as they can inform and uh, manifest the plausibility of, uh, of the scenarios. Uh, we're not interested in predictions. Uh, we're much more interested in making plausible and purposeful uh, scenarios, useful scenarios than probable ones. There's uh, people out there that like to put probability to their scenarios. We think that that's impossible in the kind of radical uncertainty that, um, that the scenarios uh, face. Uh, they're not about the self, they're about the context. They're not for anybody, but they're for somebody. And so you have to know if, if I was working for NIOSH, who exactly in NIOSH the scenarios are for. There would be different scenarios for the head of HR than the head of risk management, than the head of uh, whoever looks at uh, infrastructure. Uh, once they, their usefulness has been uh, served, they are then disposable, they're not there forever. They're much more about reframing understanding and much more of a process of inquiry, which we think is helpful if you do it several times, rather than as a one-off, they're not, they're not a product. An example of 
how this works was uh, made by Spencer Dale, who became a chief uh, economist of BP, the uh, uh, oil company that polluted so much of your uh, Gulf waters many years ago. Um, he, uh, Spencer came from the Bank of England. He was not an oil economist. And when he, um, when he took the job, he looked at the way oil economists look at oil. And um, he found four assumptions that the oil economists were making, which he felt were no, no longer helpful to him in his role. Uh, oil had been basically dealt with for many years, uh, something that would eventually uh, run out. Um, and basically as something you mine out of the ground. And he looked at how shale gas was uh, exploited and shale oil. And he came to the conclusion that maybe a lot of the industry was moving from um, mining world to a manufacturing world where the oil demand and supply curves re relate to each other and respond uh, to changes much faster. He looked at how uh, the demand for oil in the East uh, changed and therefore the role of OPEC. And what I liked about this paper and why I use it here is that it surfaces assumptions that have been long held. And what we would do with scenarios in the Oxford approach is we would then check how those assumptions play out in different contexts. So good, useful scenario planning typically takes something of a, of a sacred cow, if one can accept that metaphor without being insulting to any religion. Anything that has been deeply held as a given and say under what future circumstances would that no longer be the case. And why does that matter? Because there is a correlation between uh, misleading prejudgments and failed strategies. This is a book by Finkelstein and colleagues, which looked at 80 failed strategies. And I know it's not causality, it's correlation, but 82% of the 80 failed strategies also had people with highly misleading uh, prejudgments as a result. So there's lots of situations where uh, prejudgments and perhaps misleading experiences are not assets, uh, but liabilities. And so what you want to manufacture is alternative prejudgments to the ones that are had. So at least you can compare uh, the one uh, with the other. So for us, a definition of scenarios is that you produce, you manufacture, you don't choose, you manufacture a small set of possible future contexts of something uh, for somebody. If you don't have a user, uh, it'll be useless. And you have to have a clear purpose. So if I was working for Dr. Felkner, I would look at what is in her um, calendar. What meetings has she scheduled? What negotiations she has to enter? What presentations she will give? And I would ask her in which exact uh, element in your schedule will the scenarios help you to be better prepared, to have more options for negotiation, uh, to look smarter, whatever it, the purpose is before I start. Uh, and I would make sure that that well uh, specified use uh, interface is there so that she actually uses it. And may, in many occasions, it takes much more time to settle on what the intended use and user is than to produce the scenarios. Uh, I have a rule in the class that if you have a hundred units to invest, a hundred person days or a hundred thousand dollars, you shouldn't spend more than a third producing the scenarios. You should spend or invest two thirds of those efforts and resources and hours, making sure that the scenarios are actually going to be used uh, and, and uh, and that the purpose that they're manufactured for and designed for is served. So that's what I have to say. Uh, here is my email uh, contact. Do feel free to contact me. And at the bottom is the link to the program. It's a one week long program when COVID uh, allows us to meet. At the moment, it's a five week program uh, online, which we run uh, twice, uh, and we are always looking for live cases where uh, 
which people lend to us so that our students can, can learn uh, with life cases. If somebody in NIOS has a case that they would like 15 really good participants to work on with a good method and a decent uh, faculty guidance, please get in touch. Thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions, comments, and so on. Raphael, thank you so much. That was um, very interesting. And while folks are thinking about questions, that um, feel free to go off mute or put the questions in the chat and we'll read them. And while you're thinking about questions you might ask, um, I wonder if you could, the, the pre-reads that you provided were um, very interesting, in particular, the one about scenario planning in science-centric organizations. Uh, and certainly NIOSH, um, shares many of the common characteristics that are identified in that, in that uh, paper. In particular, we have a well-developed long uh, history with strong external stakeholder communities. Um, and they're varied. They include employers, employees, labor, professional associations, academia. Um, many of this, the methods um, in the papers that you provided are very qualitative, they involve interviews and workshops and a lot of discussing. We've been going down a path of um, looking for information that is available online and blogs and publications, um, uh, stakeholder reports to try to find trends and, and information. And I wonder if you can speak to the um, speak a, a little bit more about how we might engage the more qualitative piece. Right now, we're in a process of organizing, coding, cataloging, um, what we refer to as scanning hits, where we've been trying to look for signals of change um, that might foretell or you know, give us some insight into um, different futures. And, and I wonder if you can speak to how we might and at what point we might bring in a more qualitative process. Okay, so thanks, thanks for that. that. That comes up quite often, not only with scientists, but also with economists. Uh, um, this this a, a whole range of ways of answering that. The first one is that the really important decisions in life uh, typically are reached by qualitative rather than quantitative uh, calculations. I mean, I ask senior economists, did you really do a net present value discounted cash flow to figure out how many children you would have? No, most of them don't. I mean, now and then you do, but uh, in terms of can I afford the college education that they have and so on and so forth. Uh, when you chose your spouse or partner, did you did you do a net present value? No, you qualitatively thought, is this a good partner for me? Would I be a good partner for him or her? Uh, if you think that you might want to have children down the road with them, uh, would they be a good parent with me and so on and so forth. So part of the question is, can you bring in the rest of the person rather than just the professional part of the person into the equation? I've been in enough senior meetings in companies where comments like, okay, so those are the numbers, but it doesn't feel right, or let's do it, find me the numbers comes up, right? So the reality of it is that even in number crunchy intensive places, a lot of the decisions are done on gut feelings. And as we know, guts have uh, as many um, neurons as our brains and a gut feeling is actually a neuronal activity as well. A second answer to this uh, is given by John Kay, who writes columns in the Financial Times and who wrote a very good book. He, he might be a very good speaker for you down the road uh, on uh, radical uncertainty with Mervyn King, who was the uh, governor of the Bank of England during the 2008-2009 uh, crisis. And, and John says that uh, it's plausibility, like we do in scenarios, rather than probability that carries the day in a court of justice. 
So you might pretend that probability informs certain things in, uh, in decision making, but in courts of justice, it's not probability, it's plausibility. Is the story that the defendant and her or his lawyer is giving more plausible than that of the prosecution and the jurors decide on the balance uh, of this uh, as to whether that's the case or, or not. A third thing, uh, in fact, I'm having this conversation this very week, uh, working with these uh, very senior scientists uh, who advise governments around the world and private funders on what uh, uh, should be priorities for funding in um, the future of COVID-19 research. Uh, one of them said, uh, this method is very uncomfortable to us because of our professional training. And I responded, uh, the comfortable one has not produced uh, results that you're comfortable with, which is why you've sought out an alternative. And as we know, the future is something that comes towards us and that is expected to be different from us. So where does the difference start? At the end of the scenario uh, investigation or as part of the scenario investigation? And with Rolls-Royce, they were in trouble when I started working with them. They, their share price was half down. Uh, uh, they, they, they had lost half of their value in the stock market. An activist investor had taken a, a big chunk of their, of their shares. Um, uh, sales were down uh, uh, and so on. And uh, when I worked with the colleagues there, uh, I said, where do you want different thinking to start with? Because you're your existing thinking hasn't given you that. So scenarios are there to contest assumptions. They're going to be uncomfortable uh, if they're going to be useful. It goes with the territory that thinking about things in a qualitative way in a very quantitative intensive organization is going to feel uncomfortable. The question is not whether you're there to give them comfort. The question is there, are you, is that alternative way of engaging proving to be useful with them. And just as an example of this, uh, the previous um, uh, chief medical uh, scientist here in the UK who produces a paper, she lent us a case for Dame, Dame Sally Davis, lent us a case to the scenarios program. She had been doing an annual report to parliament on what she thought were medical priorities. And when our students, after two days of classes, interviewed her, she came back to me and she said, these questions are really important ones. And all of our ex experts have not yet asked them because they're just looking at it from the future. They're not themselves specialists and they're looking at questions that actually are gonna be very useful to my report. She even quoted our students in the, in the report because they asked different questions in a different way to the way that the usual suspects had been asking. So uh, I have a slide in our program uh, warning people they're gonna be uncomfortable with the approach. And that's part of the learning because you have to let go of certain things and think about them in, in a different way. So this is a long, long uh, response to your question. Thank you very much. Are there questions from anyone? You can either go off mute or um, put a question in the chat. Hi, uh, this is Joanne. Uh, thank you very much. This was a, a really great overview and a lot of what you said resonated. Um, one of the questions I have, and I'm trying to formulate it here is, I'm sure you've worked with many different kinds of organizations, science-based organizations, non-science-based organizations. And I'm wondering, you know, what differences in approaches you might see that work or doesn't work. And one of the interesting things with a lot of work CDC does in general is we're very uh, analytical, we're very evidence-based, practice-based, want you to be sure uh, of our recommendations. Um, but a lot of what we actually put forward also requires, has a behavioral element to it too. Knowing what to do is not necessarily the same as actually doing it. And I, I'm just curious how you've seen that play forward in, in um, uh, strategic foresight work you've done with different kinds of organizations and in particular science organizations. Uh, thanks, John. Um, 
Yes, I think the professional training does make a big difference to how you go about doing this. Uh, in this country, lawyers, in the UK, I mean, lawyers are trained on a tort law system, which is based on precedent. It's quite different than when, when you work in France where uh, they have a Napoleonic code and they work not from precedent, but from the rule. So if you have a combination of British lawyers and British scientists together, uh, they have been trained to go on facts and the precedent, which is in the past. In fact, they've been trained not to go into the future. Uh, and so it's not only that they, that, you, that they have not been trained to do scenario planning, they have been trained not to do scenario planning. And so one thing that is very helpful is, is instead of saying, you know, what do you expect to be the future of your profession? Uh, I learned this uh, years ago doing work on the future of uh, Alzheimer's for a French foundation. You don't ask, especially, we had some of the world's most senior uh, Alzheimer's specialists in, in, in the uh, workshop. You don't ask person A, who's a specialist on field A, what's the future of your field? Because they don't know. They are the, top, they are the leading edge and, and that's why they're doing research. What you say to them is, what would you expect your colleague in field D to be able to do 10 years from now that would make things different for you. And so if, if the colleague in field D is in nanotech or in artificial intelligence, and, and uh, the person you're talking with is a biophysicist, they would say, well, if AI can do this and nanotech can do that, then I'll be able to do this. So you get them to talk to each other. And part of the art of doing this well is to convene into the room what uh, Pierre Vac, uh, who brought scenario planning uh, to Shell from the French government, uh, used to call remarkable people. These are people that will have different opinions from each other, but who are willing to hear and listen to somebody that they consider uh, legit or, or, or worth listening to. So you have to convene people that will hold incompatible points of view from each other uh, and then help them to learn with each other about you know if x happens in, in 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 x field what does it change for my field and then they will ask well Raphael in your field if this changed what what would that open up for me that that helps a lot um, so uh, yeah uh, British lawyers and, and scientists are and uh, particularly difficult to work with, but not impossible if you get them to help each other figure out what the future might hold in related fields that, that could change things. So for example, in the <clears throat> Royal Society of Chemistry um, scenarios, there's one scenario where um, biology eats chemistry. I mean, chemistry is moving from applied physics to applied biology. So could you have chemists in the future that are not biologists, question mark. And another one, it's robots and AI doing a lot of the work that is now done by, by individuals, et cetera, et cetera. Does that help, John? It did, it did. Thank you very much. Uh, Raphael, we have two questions in the chat. The first is, do scenarios also provide insight into how much attention an organization should pay to changes that the future might bring versus how much to focus on immediate problems. Also, might scenario analysis techniques be applied to reframing the world of the present? So the first one is uh, attention. Um, one company I worked with many years ago uh, decided to track this empirically. <clears throat> so everybody in a, in, in a meeting was asked at the end of the meeting to uh, assess what proportion of the meeting, let's say it's an hour, an, an hour long meeting, what proportion of the time was spent on fixing yesterday's problems or problems left over from yesterday? And what proportion of the, of the time was uh, invested in, in considering a potential future uh, opportunities for top line growth or challenges uh, to it? And uh, ideally, if you were to track this, uh, uh, before, uh, during, and after the scenarios, you would have a bigger chunk of your time invested in the, into the future 
done. I mean, that's the, that's the ideal, whether it happens or not. I mean, you could even run a control group. You could have a, a half of the people not taking the scenarios uh, education that you are producing, Sarah, and, and another half, yes, and then see if, if there's a difference. But that that is something that can be empirically assessed and, and tracked. And uh, um, I, I have had a number of engagements over time when the conviction was we should be spending a bigger proportion of our week or month looking at future considerations rather than urgent ones. Let's let's time our meetings to, to, to do that. Sorry, what was the second part of the question? The second part was, might scenario analysis techniques be applied to reframing the world of the present? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so um, uh, an, an example uh, from that uh, was from Diabetes UK, where uh, the uh, bulk of the senior management uh, thought that the national health system here, the national health service, was going to be there forever. And therefore, a lot of attention needed to be engaged with them. And in a couple of the scenarios, for different reasons, uh, this was not going to be forthcoming. Uh, in fact, Google, which many of them considered to be the enemy, was going to be better at helping diabetics than the NHS. Um, and um, this is very counterintuitive and, and in some ways uh, affected the identity, professional identity of, of some of these people. And um, when COVID-19 happened, uh, they told me that it was not only that they had rehearsed different futures through the scenarios that helped, but be because they had rehearsed leaving the present that they were in, uh, it was easier to move to an alternative track. They became more agile here and now because it was not so painful to leave the track that they had been stuck on uh, prior to doing the scenarios and rehearsing alternative futures. So it was not so much the going into an alternative frame that was the challenge. It was the difficulty of leaving the frame that they had been in that had been eased. And that made them more agile and, and faster to move. I think one of the examples in one of the papers you provided was an organization that having done its scenario planning had three scenarios and insisted that any investment allocation, find, you know, budget allocations uh, support one of those three scenarios. And if it didn't, it wasn't going to make that allocation. Yeah, that, that used to present. be the case. I don't know if they still do that, but that used to be the case in Shell when I worked there in 2000, 2003. Uh, the, the very big investments needed to wash themselves against the, the scenarios. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't, they were sent back until they, they were hedged or improved or whatever. Uh, we have another question in the chat, and this relates back to the example you were giving where there was, um, I, don't, I don't remember the agency, but the principal of the agency mentioned that your students raised you know, more important questions than they'd heard to date. Do you remember that example? And could you give us a few? Yeah, minutes? it's in her annual report. Uh, uh, Dame Sally Davies, D-A-V-I-E-S. And uh, it's the, um, I, I, if, I, if I don't, if you don't find it, it's very easy to find. It was the, um, I think it was a 2018 or 2019 um, uh, annual report that the chief medical officer provides to the government. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Either people are very zoomed out or I've been <laughs> incredibly clear. I'm sure it's the latter. Okay. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, as, as I've mentioned in, in our previous discussions, NIOSH is uh, nascent in this effort, and we're finding our way. Um, do you do you do you think there's a difference in the quality or impact of scenario planning if it's done by an external consultant or if it's done by internal uh, staff capacity? Um, I don't know of any empirical research that's 
that settles that either way. So, so my my what I'm going to give you is an opinion based on having done this since since uh, 1980, and I'm still learning uh, myself. So we're we, uh, I may have more hours on the clock, but you and I are, are still learning uh, the, the methodology. Um, I think it depends more on who you hire as to whether they are you know a contractor or an employee. Um, one of the uh, things that I think is correct is that the sooner you start engaging with your quote unquote nascent uh, scenario planning with outside parties, the better. Um, my uh, boss at um, Shell uh, got Shell involved in the UNAIDS work, uh, partly because Africa is important to Shell, but also because by engaging with very demanding conditions on on AIDS, which was you know, priority number one, two, and three for many of these countries at the time, uh, he thought that the skills that we would have in Shell would be world-class. So if you and NIOSH not, not only work with your own internal challenges, but partner with other parties that are facing you know, thornier issues, that would perhaps be um, a way of making sure that your game is as good as it could be. Um, so I, I would think that if you, if you think of your practice as a service to the community, not just as a function uh, support to your own uh, activities, and that you engage uh, perhaps beyond the US if your remit allows you to do that with tricky issues and tricky problems elsewhere, you will increase your learning. If you have enough variety internally to do that and you have good people, you don't really need uh, external parties, but you might want to bring in external views to your workshops. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, we're just about at the hour. We would have time, I see there's a thank you. Um, for the interesting presentation. We'll make sure that you get this um, uh, information. Uh, any other questions or comment before we wrap it up? I would be very interested to know uh, if you're gonna do work on the future of the industrial accident. Uh, I think that that would be a really interesting piece of work. I was just talking earlier this afternoon with somebody in the mining industry, which according to a report from your own uh, organization is the most dangerous and most accident prone uh, industry in the United States. Uh, uh, this company itself has had two years of no accidents at all. Uh, uh, I, I'd be really interested to know if you think that the horrid rates I showed earlier on will continue and persist or will, will they somehow half or will they become even worse? Uh, uh, that would be, I, I think, a great service to those of us that have suffered an industrial accident or, or occupational health. Maybe we can engage your students in uh, a joint program. Well, if you, if you do have a, a live case to send to us, we run this program twice. Uh, this this um, uh, last uh, time uh, we had a water aid. Uh, we had a, a number of different organizations uh, so if you have one, uh, we're, we're game. Wonderful. And this is the beginning of a long, a long and productive collaboration. I hope so. Um, well, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining, especially our colleagues from uh, across CDC who've been able to join us today. Um, Jessica, do you want to um, give us the last slide with some updates on um, our upcoming Foresight Friday in May? And Raphael, um, many thanks um, and uh, best wishes. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Jessica? Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you to everyone, not only to our presenter, Dr. Ramirez, but also to all of our attendees for today's rich session. Um, we hope you enjoyed the hour that we've spent together. The Office of Research Integration greatly values attendee feedback on Foresight Fridays. In the chat, we've provided a link to a brief evaluation of today's event. Um, that evaluation form actually also has space where you can suggest topics and speakers for future Foresight Friday offerings. So we look forward to receiving your input. 
Uh, next month, we are excited to host colleagues from the CDC Strategic Foresight Learning and Action Network as our May 2021 Foresight Friday speakers. Uh, they will join us to provide updates and insights on two high impact strategic foresight projects that they currently have underway. So please stay tuned for future communications uh, and registration information for that May Foresight Friday. This concludes our April 2021 Foresight Friday. Thank you once again for your attendance. Stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful day.